All right. Good to have you all here. All uh, five of you. All, all six of us. Yep. Okay. Sounds good. 8.59. All right. Praise God. Praise God. Marty said good morning. All right. Looks like it's 9 o'clock by our time, and so we're going to get going here. So welcome to Community Chapel, to our service this first uh, Sunday in May. And it's good just to be here. You know, uh, there's been a lot of resistance to this service today. It's amazing. The, um, it just seems like... Uh, There are many, many things that have worked against us being together here today. So um, in Iowa, I know some of you aren't in Iowa, but in Iowa, um, the governor has given us permission to, as churches, to open uh, with caution and to uh, take steps appropriate uh, to help not to spread the virus, et cetera, like that. And so we really appreciate our governor for allowing us to do that. Um, It just puts the uh, responsibility back on us. And so while we're learning and discussing how to do that, uh, we'll keep uh, limiting the number of people that we have in our sanctuary. But um, if you've joined us um, online and you aren't in this area or you don't come to this church and you want to keep seeing us, well, we'll probably keep doing this forever. So it's pretty exciting from that standpoint. We'll see what God does. So let's just take a moment and open in prayer together. Father, we thank you for this day. Father, we thank you that you are high above all things. Lord, there is nothing that catches you by surprise. There is nothing that doesn't end around around you that you're not aware of or not in control of. And Lord, we praise you. And because of that, Lord, we hide in the shelter of your wings. As David says, Lord, precious is your loving kindness, O Lord, and that's why the children of men put their trust under the shadow of your wings. Father, we do that this morning. We praise you. Amen. Amen. So again, um, at some point we might uh, stop saying this, but uh, um, for right now, if you want to message us or you have prayer requests or um praise reports or something you want to bring to us feel free to do that on facebook through uh uh, right there on the screen if you're um, attached to our live uh, feed right now or if you want to message us message us or uh, through facebook messenger or text or whatever uh, we'll take your request before the lord and praises um, in our prayer time tonight So um, many of you have figured out how to uh, um, handle your contributions to Community Chapel, and uh, you're welcome to do that on the website. You can give through that way or through the mail or however the Lord leads you to do that. God is faithful. God is continuing to meet every need, and we thank Him for that. And so that's just an excitement that we in our church, (laughs) we regularly do because God regularly meets every need. Um, It's an amazing thing what he does. I think it was George Mueller that said uh, he was, uh, uh, he operated by faith many uh, orphanages in Great Britain. And he said that if God is in it, he will provide. And we praise him for that. Also, if uh, you have friends that aren't uh, Facebookers, then uh, we also take this video after it's finished and we'll post it this afternoon sometime onto our face or onto our YouTube channel, which is Community Chapel DSM uh, on Facebook. And, or I'm sorry, 
I got Facebook on the brain here, on YouTube, and uh, you can see those videos up there. And so... You a little thank you card. I don't do this a lot, but we got a thank you card from, uh, it says, blessed are those who give of themselves. Maybe you can read that on the camera. So we're, we've had a change up in some of our... Uh, uh, technical equipment today so I can't see myself so at first the first time we did this I hated seeing myself now I can't see myself and so I'm just as uncomfortable today as I was the first day we did this but uh, I want to read this to you this is from uh, uh, Bill and Faith McConnell and uh, Dell and Joy Brown um, who who are the leaders of our um, God is on the move work down in Mexico they actually live uh, just north of Nogales, I think it's north, just uh, across the border from Nogales, Mexico, and they have been trying to raise money, um, many tens of thousands of dollars to uh, buy property to provide a boys safe house. These are for young men who come out of prison and gives them a place, a safe place for them to live to keep them from getting back into uh, the things that put them in prison in the first place. And I just want to read this to you. It says, uh, Dear Marv, Diana, and Community Chapel Open Bible, thanks so much. All the funds are in. <laughs> That's awesome. You could see the work. I think it was like $45,000 they needed in. We sent a chunk of money from Community Chapel. And we are close to closing escrow on the boys' safe house. Praise the Lord. With grateful thanks. And as soon as I can stop crying, she ends with, uh, raise a hallelujah. I'd like for us to do that song this morning. Raise a hallelujah. And wherever you are, I know this is still an uncomfortable thing. You know, I, I know for me too, for me to sit at my couch at home and, you know, with Diana even, and even though we both are passionate about serving Jesus, there's something self-conscious about praising him in that kind of a setting. And so especially when the kids are making noise and stuff, um, it, there's an uncomfortableness, a discomfort. And yet I encourage you to bring yourself to a place of praise as we sing this song. Raise a hallelujah. In the presence of my enemies, I raise a hallelujah, louder than the unbelief, I raise a hallelujah, my weapon is a melody. Raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me. Come on. I'm going to sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder. You're going to hear my praises roar up from the ashes. Death is defeated, the king is alive. I raise a hallelujah with every.
everything inside of me. With everything inside of me. I raise a hallelujah. I will watch the darkness flee. I will watch the darkness flee. I raise a hallelujah. In the middle of the mystery. In the middle of the mystery. Raise a hallelujah. Fear you lost your hold on me. Fear you lost your hold on me. I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder. You're gonna hear my praises roar up from the ashes. Hope will arise. Death is defeated. The king is alive. I'm gonna sing it again. I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder. You're gonna hear my praises roar up from the ashes. Hope will arise. Death is defeated. The king is alive. Sing a little louder. 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 presence of my enemies sing a little louder louder than the unbelief sing a little louder my weapon is a melody sing a little louder heaven comes to fight for me sing a little louder in the presence of my enemies sing a little louder louder than the unbelief sing a little louder my weapon is a melody sing a little louder heaven comes to fight for me sing a little louder i'm gonna sing middle of the storm louder and louder you're gonna hear my praises roar up from the ashes hope will arise death is defeated the king is alive i'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm Louder and louder, you're going to hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated, the king is alive. I raise a hallelujah. Raise a hallelujah. A raise a hallelujah. A raise a hallelujah. Father, we raise that hallelujah to you this morning. Lord, in the middle of the storm. Lord, in the middle of uncertainty. When we can't see tomorrow, we trust that you see tomorrow. Holy is your name. Because our God, our God is mighty. 
Our God is holy. Our God is righteous. Our God is all-powerful. Our God is all-seeing. And holy is your name, O Lord. Holy is your name. Holy is your name. Holy is your name. There's no one like you, none like you. Into the darkness you shine, out of the ashes we rise. There's no one like you, none like you. Our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God. Into the darkness you shine. Out of the ashes we rise, there's no one like you, none like you. Our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God. One more time. Our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God. And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? What could stand against? Our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God. Our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God, our God. Is an awesome God, He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God, He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and Love. Our God is an awesome God. One more time. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. Praise the Lord. You know, it's easy to sing songs like that because our God is awesome. 
Praise his name. Praise his name. So for the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about baptism. Um, two weeks ago, we really addressed what's the big deal about baptism and what is it that is just so essential and why, why don't we, in many of our churches today, why don't we put the same kind of emphasis on it that was put on in the early church? So we talked about that. And then last week, we talked about that I need to be baptized. That as believers, we need to be, be baptized. We talked about the pattern of Scripture, that um, how important it is to look at the pattern of Scripture that we have from the early church and understand what their attitude was toward baptism and adopt that attitude. Because otherwise, we're dealing with what we talked about last week as a knockoff. It's some kind of a pseudo-Christianity. It's like a, almost an antichrist. Uh, not quite that dramatic, but it's the same idea that that Jesus made the church the way He wanted it to be. I heard this this week. I, I probably can't say it right. But, but Jesus created the church the way He wanted it. And now He's really looking for the church to be as He made it. And so we look at the Scripture. and We look at that pattern of Scripture. And we came across these four truths. And the first one was, if you believe and desire to follow Christ, you must be baptized. Number two, baptism is the regular practice for those that choose to identify with Christ, Jesus Christ as His followers. I'll say that one more time since I stuttered through it. Baptism is the regular practice for those that choose to identify with Jesus Christ as His followers. So if you choose that you're going to say yes to Jesus to follow, baptism is in the, in the cards for your life. In fact, the next one, number three, is baptism is not a choice. It is included in our yes response to Jesus' call to follow. And so when you hear the voice of Jesus saying, come follow me, live for me, and you decide to say yes, baptism is included in that yes. And then the last thing is baptism is the gateway to further growth and advancement in the things of God. We don't always even... I've never heard that taught before. And yet Scripture makes it very clear that it is the step and the next pro in the process of becoming disciples. And without that step, we lose an elementary stepping stone in the process of being disciples. Amen. We'll call that good for uh, the last couple of weeks. Praise the Lord. So today we're going to talk about distracted. Distracted. Um, any of you ever been distracted? <laughs> yeah, right? It's a major issue in our lives. It's especially in a fast-moving culture. It is a regular thing that we struggle with, distraction. So we're going to look at Luke chapter 10 today, um, and we're going to focus on uh, verses 38 to 42. And, you know, when you open that and start looking at it, those of you that are regulars at Community Chapel might go, oh, not again, not again. But yeah, it's again. So we're going to look at Luke chapter 10 verses 38 verses 38 to 42 I'll go ahead and read it here for us 
As Jesus and the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he taught, but Martha was distracted, key word, distracted, by the big dinner she was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. But the Lord said to her, My dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. There is only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her. So I'm just going to rehash this story just a, just a minute. You know, Jesus came over to, to Mary and Martha's house. It, it was Martha's house, and that kind of indicates that she's probably the older of the three siblings, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And Martha owned the house. We don't understand how that happened, but she did. She was the owner of the house. And, and so Jesus, it wasn't just Jesus, it was Jesus and the 12, at least, that came over to her house. And if you imagine in that culture, you know, there were no microwaves and, and things had to be um, prepared ahead. And she's trying to prepare this. Essentially, a, a, at least a meal would be huge for at least a dozen to 15 people, maybe more than that. And Martha and Mary um, were working on this together. And Jesus and the 12 come over and they, uh, they start chat chatting. There may have been some Pharisees there. There may have been other disciples there too. The place was probably full. And Mary gets drug away. She finds herself listening as Jesus starts to teach in the kitchen, listening, and she gets drawn away. And I can just see it. The first thing you see is she's kind of leaning on the doorway listening and running back to the kitchen and doing something and and then coming back and listening and pretty soon she walks in the doorway and before you know it she's walked clear in the room and and she has kind of gone down and sat on the ground and next thing you know she's just totally enthralled in what Jesus is saying and Martha's still back in the kitchen trying to pull this whole event together and finally she can't stand it anymore I, i'm sure none of you have ever experienced this where where a sibling just wasn't pulling their weight right yeah i i'm sure we're all pointing and nudging each other wherever we are of course in a social distancing manner but martha is looking and saying where's my sister again she's missing And she brings her plea to Jesus and says, Jesus, don't you think it's not fair? And Jesus was sympathetic to her. He uh, really felt with her and, and recognized that what she was doing was good and noble, but he recognized something different in that Mary, sitting at his feet listening, was doing something more important than what Martha was doing. And as I've said many times, our, our people have heard this many times, he basically was saying to Martha, he says, Martha, just shut the oven off and come sit down. You know, we'll all eat. None of us are going to starve. Just come and sit down. Martha, you are distracted by many things. Jesus said to Martha, there's only one thing necessary, Martha. You're doing good things. You're doing important things. But there's only one thing that is necessary, Martha. And Mary has found it. And that is sitting at my feet, listening to me teach. That is the most important thing. Everything flows from one thing. If you're a note taker, write that down. Everything flows from the one thing. As we've talked before, it's like a bicycle wheel 
And Jesus and following God is not a spoke, it's the hub. Jesus and following God is not a piece of our lives, it is the center of our lives. And that's what Jesus is saying. He says, Martha, Mary has found that one thing, that central focal point of her life. Mary has found it, and I'm not going to take her away to do something less important. Everything flows from this one thing, Martha. You know, I can hear maybe some people in our church saying, Pastor Marv, why are you so stuck on this? Why do you bring it up all the time? Because Jesus said it's the most important. And as you look through Scripture with a careful eye, you see the repetition of this over and over that Jesus says, I am the most important thing in your life, and everything else is not as important the most important thing we can do is draw near to god and spend time in his presence that is the most important thing and jesus says everything has to take second place to that everything but we get distracted things draw us away But Jesus said it. Another reason that I focus on this is sometimes I have troubles remembering lots of different things. But I can remember one thing. And this I remember. This is the one thing. Everywhere in Scripture I look, I see it. You know, the devil knows about the one thing too. He knows what is the most important for us. And so his job, his main objective is to distract us. I mean, he would really like us to all turn our backs on Jesus and just say, Forget that. I'm not going to follow him. I don't want to do that. He would love for us to do that. But if he can't get us to do that, his main objective is to distract us from the one thing. If he could keep us from nourishment, then what happens is is, is in that in that objective that he has to keep us from nourishment, then he he tries to keep us malnourished. So that we're not strong. So maybe there's life there, but there's just barely any. The devil knows about the one thing. Martha was distracted, worried, and troubled about many things. You know, the thing about Martha, you know, sometimes she gets a bad rap. But, you know, Martha loved Jesus. She loved Him. And she followed him. She, he was her master too. And she wanted what Mary was doing. She, her heart wanted to do what Mary was doing. But Martha felt that her responsibilities required that she do something different. And so she really envied what Mary was doing. Martha wanted to be there too. Martha wanted to be there too. Maybe you can relate. You see someone, you know someone who spends time with Jesus on a regular basis and and you want to do that too. But there are distractions. There are things that prevent us. Things that, I'll say it, that we allow to keep us. And you say, wow, Pastor Marv said, you just, you just don't understand what my house is like. You don't understand what the distractions are like and, and what I hear in my head and what I hear through my ears and, and all the things that keep me from doing 
what I know I want to do. I know in my head I want to read the Bible. I know I want to pray. I want to spend time with you, Lord, and just the quiet. That's what I want to do. But there are so many distractions. So many distractions. So my main time of prayer is in the morning. And most of the time I try to get out of bed and go do that absolutely first before there are any distractions. If Diana's already up when I get up, it's usually one of these things. You know, she sees me, I see her, and we kind of do this and I keep moving. Sometimes if she's not up yet, I might make coffee, but I've learned to do that and to stay focused and then go to prayer because I know what distractions are. The other night I had a dream. I don't normally have dreams that I remember anyway, or if I do, they're just so ridiculous that um, and disjointed that It's hard for even me to put any kind of continuity together. The other day, I had a dream in the night. And the next night, I had the same dream. And I could remember it clearly. And in the morning when I woke, I laid in bed because it was strange for me to have a dream that I could remember. And I'm wondering, Lord, is this something you want me to remember? Is this something that that I should learn from? Is this something that, that I need to know? And I laid in bed and I tried to recount the dream and tried to hear what God might say through it. And I went downstairs and I told Diana the dream and and we went through it and and I realized it was just a distraction. But by the time it was I was all done, this these headphones are a distraction. They, I usually have a shirt between the cords and they you know, it's gross. You know. I missed my prayer time because of a distraction. A couple days ago, I was in my office here at church and and things had been real busy and I, I just really was longing for time with the Lord. And all of a sudden, I mean, we had people working here, we had uh, service people here, and and finally everything's quiet. I've got about an hour before the next thing. And I sat at my desk and I was just quiet. And I said, God, I just want to be with you. I just want to spend some time with you. So I started just spending some time with him. And the phone rang. And it was one of our daughters. And I don't always get to talk to them, and I wanted to talk to them. And so I talked to Heather for quite a while. And then I hung up the phone and um, went back to where I was. Lord, I just want to spend time with you. And our other daughter, Hillary, called. And I wanted to talk to her. I wanted to talk to her. And by the time we got done, I'd been distracted. I hesitated even to say this about my daughters because I love them and and I did what I wanted to do. But in our lives, don't we get torn? 
Don't our intentions sometimes get derailed? Last night I was pulling the rest of this message together at home, sitting in the living room, and we had the front door open because the weather was really nice. And all of a sudden one of our neighbors started a verbal argument outside. I was distracted. In Mark chapter 6, in Mark chapter 6, Jesus learns about the death of John the Baptist. And all the emotions that go with his murder. And the disciples had been off on a mission trip, a ministry trip, and they're just getting back. And so there's just this huge hubbub. And Jesus has just gotten this news about John the Baptist. The disciples are back. And, and Jesus says, he says, let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place and rest a while. He said this because there were so many people coming and going that Jesus and His apostles didn't even have time to eat. So they left by boat for a quiet place where they could be alone. The rest of that story is the feeding of the 5,000. They get to the other side of the lake and there's all these hordes of people that need ministry and and the good intentions of getting away in quiet time went down the toilet. I guess they didn't really have toilets then. But... So we all struggle. But we have to work it out. We have to work it out because the distraction to not spend time with the Lord is a common thing in our lives, in our culture, was a common thing in every culture thus far. And we say, yeah, but the 21st century is so busy, it's just so crammed full of information, and, and yeah, 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 but you know what? Every culture has their equally oppressive distractions. And in Scripture we see, I mean, I have, I have lists I have a list of people in scriptures that struggled. And this is just by no means exhaustive. And there were winners and those that were losers. There were those who won the battle against distractions, at least for the most part. That doesn't mean that they never lost to distractions. But for the most part, they learned how to say no to distractions or to make the quiet time at another place, but they chose, they figured out how to find time with their God. Jesus in Mark chapter 1, verse 32. I'm going to read this to you. Um, 32, 33, 34, 35. It says, That evening after sunset... Now keep after sunset, all right? After sunset. This is nighttime. After sunset. Many sick and demon-possessed people were brought to Jesus. The whole town gathered at the door to watch. So Jesus healed many people who were sick with various diseases, and He cast out many demons. But because the demons knew who He was, He did not allow them to speak. And then just matter-of-factly, Mark says this. He says, but before daybreak the next morning, Jesus got up. So it's dark already, right? It's dark already. And all of these people come with great need to be ministered to by Jesus. So how long do you think that took? You know, in an equatorial kind of a setting, you know, the sun may not go down till 7 30, 8 o'clock. And so, how long do you think he ministered realistically? Two, three, four hours, maybe? And then, and Mark says, 
before daybreak? So when do you think Jesus fell into his, onto his little mat? And yet before daybreak, somehow he found it within himself to rise before the sun. And it says, Jesus got up, went out to an isolated place to pray. You know, Jesus prayed at night because that may have been the only time he wasn't distracted. You know, it's interesting if you read that Mark story. In the morning when Jesus comes back, the disciples are already looking for him, saying, Jesus, where you been? Like, you think they should have known? Jesus, where you been? Everybody's looking for you. Everybody's looking for you. You know, in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 7, there was a potential distraction where the, the widows in Jerusalem, Christians who spoke Greek, were somehow being missed in the daily distribution of food. And so the problem was brought to the apostles and the apostles rightly recognized it as a distraction. Not that the widows didn't need to eat. Of course they did. But they realized that even an important thing can be a distraction to what we have to do. And they said, we're going to delegate people to do this because we have to spend time in prayer and the Word. It's the one thing we have to do. Moses was distracted by the need for justice among the people. And his father Jethro taught him how to delegate so that Moses could take care of the one thing that he needed to do. You know, some of our young men in our church, they read the Scriptures at night. It's a quiet time, a quiet place. You know, I have another distraction in my office. I have a clock that goes tick, 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 tick. Are you annoyed yet? Tick, tick. And when I'm working in my office and it's quiet and there are no trains going by or no traffic that I hear going by, all I hear is tick, 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 tick. That clock is going to be replaced. It's going away. It's a distraction. You know, in 2 Chronicles 16, you can read the story of Asa, the king of Judah. And Asa did not deal with the distractions in his life. And at the end of his life, he did not follow God as closely as he did at the beginning. The rich young ruler that we talk about from time to time, the rich young ruler... He thought that his heart was wholly over to God. He thought that he really had done everything possible to love the Lord his God with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength. And Jesus says, no, young man, you're distracted by your wealth. He went away sad because he made a choice to follow the distraction rather than his heart to follow God. I encourage you to read John chapter 15. There's a verse in verse 2 where Jesus is talking about the Father being our gardener. And Jesus is saying that the Father also, as we draw near to Him, when, when, we, when we let go of the distractions and we draw near to the Lord, He says the Father helps us in our distractions. Because He says in 15.2, He says, He, the Father, cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't bear fruit and He prunes 
the branches that do bear fruit so they will produce even more. That If you imagine that fluid in the vine going down through the vine, and the Father identifies a place of fruit that He wants to grow, and so what He does is He lops off chunks, maybe I'm out of the camera there, He lops off chunks of the vine past where He wants the growth to be. We have to look in our lives and see that this one thing, this drawing near to Jesus, is the one thing that brings life in my life. In my life, And the Father, we let Him prune back those things that are good. There's actually fruit out here. And yet the Father prunes back so that we bear more fruit. He helps us take away those distractions. Two last things. Without learning to deal with distractions, we're always dependent on someone else to feed us spiritually. Jesus was saying to Martha, Martha, it's so important that you learn to feed yourself. If you're always pulled here and there and you never have the time to sit down and digest the Word and spend time with the Father in prayer, you never grow. All you get is what Pastor Marv gives you. And there are coming times, even right now, how many of us can't spend time at church or can't get to the Bible study or can't do this and we, and we almost don't know how to feed ourselves because we've, we're always pulled away by distractions. And without learning to deal with distractions, we are always dependent on someone else to feed us Spiritually, we never learn to feed ourselves. We are always dependent on someone else. We stay babies. Always waiting for someone else to stick a bottle in our mouth or to put some Cheerios on our, on our tray, on our high chair, or put some little vegetables already cut up. We never learn to open the refrigerator and pull the vegetables out and cut them up ourselves. We never learn to mix a drink for ourselves, to drink it ourselves, because we've never had the time to learn because we're always distracted. You know, in my heart, I, don't, I can't tell you how many times I've come to this place, I say, Lord, forgive me Forgive me for not taking the time. Forgive me. You know what? The Lord always forgives. But I got to tell you something. Listen to this. Repentance initiates forgiveness, but God's grace and forgiveness does not replace what would have been gained by drawing near. I want to say that one more time. Repentance initiates forgiveness. That means when we say sorry to God, He forgives. But that doesn't replace what we would have learned, what, how we would have grown had we taken time in the quiet place. Does that make sense? He always forgives, but that doesn't make us any stronger. That doesn't make us any more wise. That doesn't increase the knowledge of our God because He was trying to do that in the quiet place. He's trying to teach us in the secret place. There is a richness that He would have imparted to us that we missed.
when we let distractions draw us away, we don't just miss reading a chapter. We miss time with Almighty God that He would strengthen us and empower us and help us to be strong, to rise up for the next distraction. He is faithful. He empowers us. He gives us strength. But we have to recognize what the enemy is trying to do in distracting us. I'm going to sing a song. It's kind of an old song. It's called, I Want to Be Where You Are. And then we'll pray together. I just want to be where you are Dwelling daily in your presence I don't want to worship from afar Draw me near to where you are I just want to be where you are in your dwelling place forever take me to the place where you are i just want to be with you i want to be where you are dwelling in your presence feasting at your table Surrounded by your glory in your presence, that's where I always want to be. I just want to be, I just want to be with you, oh my God. You are my strength and my song. When I'm in your presence, though I'm weak, you're always strong. I just want to be where you are, dwelling daily in your presence. I don't want to worship from afar. Draw me near to where you are. I just want to be where you are. In your dwelling place forever. Take me to the place where you are. I just want to be. I just want to be with you. I just want to be. I just want to be with you. I just want to be. I just want to be. Father, we praise You. Lord, that's the cry of our heart this morning. So Lord, that we would find a way to be with You. Father, give us the strategy. Show us how to recognize the distractions. Open our eyes to see, O oh Lord. Our ears to hear Your call. Oh God, and give us courage, Father, to turn the oven off. Lord, to find that secret place in the night, early in the morning. 
Father, teach us. Teach us, O oh Lord. Thank you, Father. You're so good and great, merciful and kind. How precious is your loving kindness to us, O oh Lord. That's why the children of men put their trust under the shadow of your wings. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Praise God. Go in the strength of the Lord and listen to His voice today. He is wanting to draw you close to Him. Amen. Have a great week. Amen.